Modern Love, the podcast, is supported by... Produced by the iLab at WBUR Boston. From the New York Times and WBUR Boston, this is Modern Love. Stories of love, loss, and redemption. I'm your host, Meghna Chakrabarty. You know how it goes. A story makes headlines, and for a while you hear about it constantly. But then, gradually, the spotlight fades, and those names and faces that were once everywhere, suddenly, they're gone. You rarely get to hear the rest of their story, the story behind the story. But Josh Fatal shared his with modern love. Here's Joshua Jackson, best known for roles in Showtime's The Affair and the 90s hit Dawson's Creek, reading Josh's piece, Reaching Out Between the Bars. Jenny showed up to my welcome home party in Philadelphia. Hundreds attended, but my eyes kept finding their way back to hers. It had been three years since we'd seen each other, the last two of which I spent imprisoned, partly in solitary confinement, in Evan Prison in Tehran, Iran. On that fateful day, more than 26 months earlier, I had been detained with my friends Shane Bauer and Sarah Shurid after we unknowingly hiked over an unmarked border of Iraqi Kurdistan into Iranian Kurdistan. We were old college friends, vacationing in that relatively safe region between work assignments abroad, and the locals had told us about a beautiful waterfall in the mountains that would make for a suitable day hike. Our mistake was continuing past the waterfall to the ridgeline for the view, where an armed Iranian border guard spotted us and motioned us down to him. First, He took us to his border outpost. And then we were loaded into a car and whisked away. The Iranian authorities ultimately charged us with espionage, which was farcical given we had little money, no language skills, and no means to sustain ourselves beyond a day hike. We knew we had become political prisoners, our detention reflecting the fraught history between the United States and Iran, a relationship that had soured slowly since the CIA-backed coup in 1953 and its support of the country's authoritarian king until 1979. For the first few months, before Shane became my cellmate, I was held in solitary confinement. Once we were together... Shane and I needed each other, but also needed space so badly that the relationship became painfully intimate. I was not allowed to interact with other prisoners besides him, and occasionally Sarah, until the Iranian government released us, marking the end of my nightmare and hope for a new life. After my welcome home party, Jenny and I went for drinks. And the next morning, she came to my parents' house and woke me up. I felt like I was your girlfriend at the party, she said. I felt the same way, I said, without hesitation. Jenny and I had acted together in our fourth grade play, Free to Be a Family. In seventh grade, we played Ouija together in her attic. In middle school, we dated, but I didn't have the guts to hold her hand or kiss her at her bat mitzvah. A mutual friend called me soon after to tell me that Jenny just wanted to be friends, which we remained through high school. In college, in the years that followed, we touched base every so often to see if we were growing closer or drifting apart. Jenny had emailed me the day I was captured to check in, but I never had the chance to respond. Our sporadic rendezvous in our mid-twenties replayed in my mind while I was trapped behind thick cement walls a world away. Nine months into my incarceration, the authorities granted my mother a one-time visit. 
desperate for information. I asked her about the political negotiations for my release and about our family and friends. And I asked her about Jenny. Jenny was in a serious relationship then, but my mother, afraid that the truth would upset me, lied and said she didn't know if Jenny was with anyone. Sitting with me in my childhood bedroom, the morning after my party, Jenny explained that she had recently broke up with her boyfriend of a few years. We both knew we needed to take it slowly. She was affected by the breakup and, as a medical student in West Virginia, was trying to focus on her studies. I had little memory of the nuances of daily life, let alone the nuances of a love life. I was 29 and had trouble ordering from a menu. I regimented my home life to mimic my prison routines, cutting my nails on Fridays, exercising at 3.45 p.m. When my friends saw me after my release, they said I seemed baby-like, raw, and skittish. I didn't know if I should return home to Philadelphia, resume my job in rural Oregon, or try to rebuild the life I once had in Oakland, California. Jenny and I started writing handwritten letters to each other, which seemed more thoughtful and reflective than email. (laughs) I imagine she would wax philosophical like she used to when she would send me letters at sleepaway camp, but in her first letter, she wrote bluntly, I don't want to have sex until I'm married. I had not had sex for years, but I didn't let it worry me. I wrote back about the struggles with my newfound freedom. Free life was vast compared to a tiny cell, but my mind continued to linger in that confined space. It seemed like ghosts of Iranian prison guards were finding me in my free life. At the motor vehicle department, the landlord's office, and the bank, where people talked to me the same way they had in Iran. I don't know. You'll have to talk to my boss. He's not in right now. It made me furious. Months after the party, Jenny and I became more serious, though love still didn't quite make sense to me. Ours wasn't at all like the relationships I was used to with my cellmate, the prison guards, or the interrogators. I didn't have to commit to a hunger strike or bang on the cell door to be heard, and this new way of interacting was welcome, but more complicated. I took an open-ended visit to West Virginia to write my memoir and to see how it went between us. One night, after writing about how Shane and I bickered over the petty details of our tiny cell, I couldn't fall asleep. I got angry with Jenny for how she looked at me, for the way she sighed in the middle of our conversations, for leaving the bathroom light on. She cried as I carried on, ostensibly talking about my feelings and demanding apologies, all the while remaining oblivious to the fact that I was reliving the pettiness of my imprisoned existence. I didn't stop until she yelled, I'm not Shane. Therapy stirred up questions about whether I was ready for an intimate relationship. Did I need to find my own place in the world before I could be with somebody else? The history between Jenny and me made our reconnection so powerful, but how important was our past? Was I simply playing out a middle school fantasy? I visited my grandfather, who had been a psychoanalyst since the 1950s, and he himself had laid on an analyst's couch four days a week for six years after fighting in World War II. The first question he asked me was, did you know that you were arrested on my birthday? It pleased him to think of Jenny and me ending up together. After all, he had fought the Germans with his middle school sweetie's name, Muriel, my future grandmother, carved into the barrel of his rifle, though they hadn't dated for years. I told him about Jenny, and he told me that a loving relationship can be the most rewarding part of moving on. Jenny gave up her premarital sexual prohibition, and we started to discuss having children. She flew with me to meet my father's relatives, who live just north of Tel Aviv. Israel started bombarding Gaza while we were there. We prayed for peace at the Western Wall, painted our faces with Dead Sea mud, and fell deeper in love. 
On the flight back, Jenny vomited. And I thought it was because of the turbulence and an effort to purge Israeli politics from her system, but she was pregnant. Eight months later, Jenny went into labor in the apartment we were sharing in Philadelphia. She practiced yogic breathing, sat in an inflatable pool. Thirty hours later, I caught our son and placed him on her chest. It was July 30th, the day before both my grandfather's birthday and the anniversary of my detention. We gave our son the middle name Azad, which in Farsi means free. Since my son had taken his place in the world, I could no longer dally in finding mine. We moved to Brooklyn. I began a graduate program to study history. Of all the apartment buildings in New York City, we unknowingly chose to move into the exact one my grandfather had lived in after the war. After years of feeling utterly unsettled, I sensed I was now exactly where I should be. Finding love helped me find my way amid the tangles of history, and it helped Jenny and me secure a place in the world where, like the aptly titled play from our childhood, we were free to be a family. Joshua Jackson reading Josh Fatal's essay, Reaching Out Between the Bars. It's been almost two years since Josh wrote that piece. We'll hear how he's doing today after the break. We're back. It's Modern Love, the podcast. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty, and now a postscript from Modern Love editor Daniel Jones and the author of this week's essay, Josh Fatal. One of the reasons I wrote the piece is that there was a set of coincidences which I was grappling with that I had struggled to make sense with. I mean, the, the thing that really got me thinking about it was when I was looking for housing in New York City and the apartment building that I picked in Brooklyn happened to be the exact place that my grandfather moved into after he finished uh, serving in World War II. So that was just too uncanny. (laughs) It was too uncanny to believe, really. When I was in prison, I felt like one of the things that was happening to my mind and to my being was that I I was shutting out any kind of coincidence and serendipity. I mean, the world was just so metallic and cold. I mean, there was a metal breakfast cart rolling down, uh, you know, the halls, and it just all felt, like, so harsh and clangy, and there was this coldness to how I had to start to think in terms of Every time I thought there was some sign I was getting out, well, it wasn't true. You know, I realized it was just magical thinking. And so coming out of prison for me was sort of the possibility for for these things to happen in a way that they just were not possible uh, when I wasn't free. So I'm not in the habit of reading essays that are submitted to me and being fam- at all familiar with the story. So when Josh's story crossed my desk. You know, I knew this story. I'd followed the story in the news. So for me, this was a different reading experience. And I was so eager just from the start to think, well, what what is it like to be in this prison? What is it like once you're out? And how does it affect your relationships? And what I thought Josh did such a good job of is talking about, you know, how being in a prison and being uh, in this unending, you really don't know where the end point is. You don't have a sentence, you know, you're not getting paroled at a certain point. You're just either in there or at some point you're going to be released. And what does that do to you psychologically? Um, So he just brings all this baggage back from Iran with him. Well, I mean, the first time I got an apartment and set up living on my own after getting out of prison, I uh, promptly 
locked myself out of the apartment and and left my keys in there. And I realized, man, I hadn't, uh, I haven't been used to using keys in a long time. At one point, I remember noticing that almost every time I walked out of the door, I felt this like sense of relief. I would like take a big sigh and I would re- feel relieved. And at a certain point, I noticed that I was, I'm always sighing when I walk out, and I was simultaneously adjusting and becoming aware of how much I was adjusting. It was hard to keep it all in mind. It was really nice to see, too, how he was limited in so many ways in being able to get things going with Jenny and figure out what they were going to do. He's so caught up in, in control for understandable reasons, and in this case, it was it was good to have him pushed out of that zone of control where he thinks, okay, things are moving along now. Let's see where it's going to go. For Josh and fellow prisoners Shane Bauer and Sarah Shord, part of working through their experience involved writing a book together. They tell their story in the memoir A Sliver of Light, which was published in 2014. One of the things of coming back was getting used to not just free life or America or whatever. It was also stepping into a whole new life role. I mean, I was in the news for two years straight and people were recognizing me. A woman a few months ago saw me on the subway and as I didn't say anything, but as I was getting off, she looked at me and she said, thank you. Um, and I kind of looked at her like, like, what for? And she was like, it was a good book. <laughs> and, um it took me a long time to get used to remembering how much people had seen me in the media. Josh is still in contact with Shane and Sarah, who are married and live in California. Josh and Jenny are married and live in New York City, where he's a Ph.D. candidate in history at NYU. Their son, Isaiah, is now almost three years old, and Josh is already beginning to think about how he'll eventually talk to his son about his imprisonment. Just this past week, he was wearing his, what we call his freedom shirt, which is the shirt from uh, Jenny and my fourth grade play, which is Free to Be a Family. And so he was looking at it and he was saying, this, this is my freedom shirt. And then he said, Daddy, what does freedom mean? And uh, I just told him that um, he would have to find that out for himself. Josh Vital, author of this week's essay, Reaching Out Between the Bars. He's also co-author of the memoir, A Sliver of Light. We also heard from Modern Love editor Dan Jones. Special thanks to Joshua Jackson for reading this week's piece. He stars in Showtime's The Affair, which is now in its fourth season. More after the break. Next week, Chloe Grace Moretz from our live performance at the Provincetown Film Festival. With the trip looming, we decided, at my urging, to break up for real this time. I thought I would feel liberated. Instead, I spent my days mooning around the house, crying or baking to distract myself from crying. I forced myself to remember that Well, this was exactly what I wanted. After all, love was so flimsy when held up against virtues like independence and freedom. So why did it feel like a vestigial arm, something fused onto me that I couldn't get rid of no matter how hard I tried? Modern Love is a production of the New York Times and WBUR, Boston's NPR station. It's produced, directed, and edited by Jessica Alpert, Caitlin O'Keefe, John Parati, and Amory Sievertson. The idea for the Modern Love podcast was conceived by Lisa Tobin. Iris Adler is our executive producer. Daniel Jones is the editor of Modern Love for the New York Times and advisor to the show. Music for the podcast, courtesy of APM. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. See you next week.